Like, I don't know why we didn't meet last year in Alphard. I, I heard a lot about you. And so I'm really happy today that I can ask you the questions I'm really interested in. <laughs> at, the, at the European Alphard Forum last year, they had me very busy. They had me for three different talks in one day, uh, wow. which is a lot. Would we start with a more formal um, introduction? Because I know you by my by the explanations of my friends and I read the website of Project Rodan. But maybe people who are watching us uh, want to know more about what you do and um, what's your task at Project Rodan and what Project Rodan is in general. Sure. Okay, great. So my name is Chad Fishman. I'm the vice president and research director at Project Drawdown. Uh, Project Drawdown is a nonprofit uh, organization uh, uh, that was founded in 2014 uh, with a task to map, model, and describe the most substantive solutions to stopping and beginning to reverse global warming. This is, and my role uh, is to to help uh, design the the models, the tools that we use to evaluate data. Lots and lots and lots and lots of data of all these different technologies and practices, and then map them in a in a system looking at you know markets of markets of demand, you know, global markets, and, and 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 biophysical characteristics of land and oceans and and food pet consumption patterns, and all that all that stuff. So these tools we 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 use to collect this data and then map out what this system looks like, and what would happen if we adopted solutions instead of continuing to work with the problem, right? In terms of what are the real technologies and practices that exist today that when taken together as a system of solutions can achieve this point in time called drawdown. What drawdown means is it's that point when atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases begins to decline on a year to year basis. So when we uh, emit greenhouse gases, which are essentially heat trapping gases into the atmosphere, this causes global warming. We've heard about this is the, this is the, this was, uh, uh, this is the challenge, is the problem that causes climate change to occur, right? It's the increasing temperatures uh, that we're experiencing globally. Um, but when we change the composition of those gases in the atmosphere, right? we start to reduce those concentrations that are kept in that atmosphere at different lengths in time. Different gases are there in different, different, for different lengths and trap gases and heat in different ways. But when we start to decrease that concentration, we can affect global cooling. We can stop global warming and begin the process of slowly reversing it. And that is what drawdown means. And that is, in my opinion, uh, a prerequisite for achieving the sustainable development goals, as well as a prerequisite for achieving something even more ambitious, the regenerative development goals. Creating a regenerative economy, regenerative society, where humanity and nature are linked inextricably, because really we are already linked. We're now just in a system of extraction and exploitation. We need to move to a system of restoration and regeneration uh, and do so linking arms together with the regeneration, right? Um, and you'll see here behind me, this little poster of, uh, and you can't see it very clearly there, but these are a hundred different technologies and practices. 80 exist today. They're already there. You don't need to invent them. They work, they're scaling, they're scientifically valid, they're financially viable. They're already being implemented. Mm -hmm. so it's great. Can you explain a bit how you use the data? Like how does, I don't know, a certain solution, a certain measure come to your table or to your office and you decide whether, hmm, should we take a look at that? Or no, nah, that's not really interesting. How do you do that? How can I imagine this process? That's a super good question, Anna. And so it has to, it has to be scientifically allowed to start. Two, it has to be um, more or less financially viable within a 30 year time period with using conservative uh, financial metrics. Um, and what that means, there has to be a, a business case for it. Uh, three, it has to be scaling. And that, what we mean by that, it doesn't have to be, you know, you know, dominating the market, but it has to be showing an increase in trajectory of adoption 
so that we can confidently say that this is not a, a you know technology that's really focused in one area, one small market, but something that actually is applicable globally, can be scaled globally. Um, and third, fourth, we need to think about externalities. Now, what we mean by that is the, essentially a cost benefit analysis. What are the uh, positive uh, implications of these solutions that go beyond uh, just the implementation? What are the potential trade-offs? So there's some mm -hmm. positives mm -hmm. and negatives that go along with these solutions. We want to make sure that our solutions are more positive by a lot of long measure than negative. Does it roughly, uh, do we estimate that it could reduce up to half a gigaton of carbon dioxide equivalent over a 30 year period? And I was really interested in if ranking is also kind of a, like why you do it, because I thought maybe it's also some kind of psychological trigger for people to. I don't know, to make it more tangible, the, the measures? Or, or is there another reason behind this? But what, the way we rank them is really based on a simple common metric. And that is uh, uh, the total amount of CO2, ca carbon dioxide equivalents, that's either avoided and or sequestered from the atmosphere. That's it. Now, there are lots of other ways one can rank them. You can rank them based on feasibility. You can rank them based on uh, uh, return on investment. You can rank them on the abatement costs. So in other words, how much it costs to uh, achieve that, uh, like a, a benefit of that dollar per ton of CO2 equivalent. Um, you could do all the kind of ranking you want to. We really wanted to focus on just the total amount of CO2 equivalent because at the end of the day, we are, these solutions are responding to the atmosphere, right? And that's when we actually achieve drawdown is about as an atmospheric condition. It's a, that's, the, that's the point, right? And it also gives you a really good sense of the types of solutions across those sectors that you mentioned too, right? So we often think about electricity generation as the most, uh, like biggest problem. It is, is 25% of global greenhouse gases, you know, as, as, a, as a single sector. Uh, and we think of renewable energy as the most important solution. And there are, it is really incredibly important, right? We need to be 100% clean renewable grid, okay? But there's 75% of the other emissions happening, right? This is happening in buildings and transportation and industry, and 24% of global greenhouse gases come from food, agriculture, and land use. And we start to think about the whole system and all these different solutions across these sectors, and we start to see that in food, agriculture, land use, and in our ecosystems, not only are they avoiding emissions, right? There's a ways to avoid the emissions from, because these are actually emitters, but we also are sinks, which means they act as, sequ sequ they, they sequester carbon on an annual basis through photosynthesis. So we, which, which, which converts uh, carbon dioxide to soil organic carbon and, and biomass, or, or, or the actual composition of the plant. We can think of trees as giant sticks of carbon, right? Um, so, so in that process of converting that into carbon, you get, you get the effect of avoiding emission, the 24% of global greenhouse gas can be avoided, plus you can sequester carbon. So in terms of problem fixing, yes, they're really important, but in terms of solutions, you get a double impact, right? You get to avoid the emissions and sequester more carbon. And I think that's really important to remember. And when the rank, you see the rankings, you start to see reduced food waste, health and education, plant-rich diets as the one, two, three solution. And that just kind of changes people's whole framing. And you start to say, oh, okay, so there's solutions everywhere, everywhere. And they all have a, a, a big effect on this. Did you get a lot of those uh-huh effects where people were like, oh, wow, yeah, now, now I see the difference. And I don't know, do you get it sometimes with decision makers where you stand next to them and they're like, Ah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I get that all the time. And, and it's funny, particularly when we talk about food. It's a funny thing because it's time about food. Because we start to think about this as a system. Um, and we just take food as an example, food and land use. When we adopt all these regenerative agricultural practices that we profile in the book, everything from conservation agriculture and tropical tree staple crops, silvopasture, all these things that we do, we can talk more about what they are, but 
we have a, you know, a, a whole list of them. We also reduce our food waste and adopt a plant-rich diet, which is a healthy diet. It's not vegan or vegetarian. It's reducing meat consumption to healthy levels but an overconsumption overall. But we adopt all three of those types of solutions, production, waste, and, and consumption. What our results show is that um, we would produce, we could produce enough food on current cropland to feed the world's population now until 2050 and beyond, assuming population growth, on current farmland. What that means is that we don't have to cut down forests to feed our population because we have enough right now. We're just not using it properly, right? And not only would we have enough for to feed everybody, we would also have enough cropland for bioplastics, for uh, organic insulation, for bio, some biofuels, for second generation biofuels, and so on. We'd have a list of dedicated biomass available without having cut down forests. And when you start to talk about that to policymakers and start to talk about, well, so you saying that these are solutions to climate, global warming, food security, health and nutrition, and improving livelihoods for farmers, smallholders, and large farming operations, Improving water retention, reducing pollution, benefiting uh, 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 um, benefiting our ecosystems and biodiversity. It, it, it's just that, uh huh, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could do this all together. Wow. <laughs> uh, that's how I often try to talk to policymakers, to to business leaders, to to anyone. Is is that here are the solutions, and then let's let's not talk about the blame game, but talk about how you can actually have enjoy and, and actually see the opportunity, uh, the opportunities in adopting the solutions. I think the, the perspective on how to, how to see the, the changes we have to make, you just explained, is really important because especially when we talk about food or agriculture, it's quite, we come quite soon to individual measures. So not to measures which have to be taken on the political scale or about our economies or agriculture seen in a European way, but about what I am eating every day. And that's, that's very interesting because when we talk about transportation or energy or electricity, we talk about systems or infrastructures, but we, when it comes to food, then it's quite individual. Then it's about blaming and shaming. Then it's about what are you eating and um, what, what is he or she buying in the supermarket? That, that's quite interesting. And then uh, uh, maybe we have also another idea how we could change this perspective of just looking on individual measures rather than explaining to people more that it's not that what they are doing on their own as individual is important, of course but it's not gonna change and it's not gonna stop global warming. Well, I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair point. And I think, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, complicated, uh, a complicated answer is that we do have individual agency in our own lives to take actions that on aggregate do indeed have a significant impact when we talk about reduced food waste or plant rich diet, these are some of the most substantive solutions that we as individuals every day, three times a day, uh, and so if, we're, if, we're, if, we're, if we're lucky, right, uh, three times a day, can make these kinds of decisions in our own lives. Um, and there are many other of these solutions that are things that we can actually do. You know, we can think about it as like choosing your own adventure. I don't know if that translates either, but you, you find your way into the things that you can do and that you are able to do uh, and that you enjoy doing, and then you talk about. It. So th there is individual actions that do make a really big difference, but that's a bottom-up uh, approach and absolutely essential. I wanna link arms with you on it and I wanna link arms with everyone here listening to this call. We can do that on our individual terms from bottom-up approach and have, have an impact but when we start to link arms and start to talk about it to our families, our friends, our communities, we move from the individual action of my world to our, the we, the, com, the institutional change. I call this the middle out. And so bottom up, but in the middle out is where we see educational institutional communities coming together. We see uh, corporations, uh, businesses, which are essentially 
aggregations of individuals coming together towards achieving certain goals um, and, and, and other forms of, in, of institutions. Um, and we need that middle out institutional change when the individual becomes more part of a collective we. And we also need top down. So those regulatory mechanisms, policies, financial uh, mechanisms that uh, governments, policymakers have the decision-making authority to enact and incentivize the system as well. So we cannot be pointing to individuals and blaming and shaming individuals and saying, you need, it's up to you to do that. Some corporations, some, some fossil fuel corporations have fed many campaigns focusing and pointing fingers on individuals. That is ridiculous. Last year in summer in Austria, we had national elections and um, the climate topic was the, the topic on top, like all parties um, talked about it. But then um, there was also a lot of talks about the schnitzel. I don't know if you, if you know what a schnitzel <laughs> is. <laughs> I, I but it's, so. You do? Okay. <laughs> So it's a meat, it's a typical meat dish, a uh, typical Austrian meat dish. And one politician even said, no Austrian can live with um, a schnitzel, which um, crashes all the ideas of, we, we have to take a look at the whole system, at the view. Um, so where do you see, or where do you meet those progressive politicians and, and how do you get to them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a really good, Really good question, and um, and I'll be honest, it's hard. It's hard. Um, I think uh, one of the challenges I think we face when interacting with policymakers is oftentimes they feel that that my experience anyway is that they think that they actually know the solutions, but I don't think they do oftentimes. And when you really start to ask them deeper questions, they know the broad contours or the 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 the, the, the sort of the solution areas, right? They know electricity generation, they may know buildings or transportation, they may know a little bit if they're savvy that, oh, we should, you know, reduce our meat consumption. But they very rarely actually know all, like the specific technologies, specific practices that are already being implemented. And I think when you start, when I, what I like to do when I get into those situations, um, trying to talk to policymakers um, and say, well, how do, you know, like exploring what these solutions are, I really like to show that list, like, like this map, like this um, poster, or some some sort of you know the slides of all the different solutions, and say these are the specific technologies and practices that work. And when they start to actually, you know, like uh, um, uh, go through the go through them and see the solutions and understand what they actually are, it makes a lot more sense to them. So they're not really talking about uh, uh, broad ideas or, or big big sector level changes, they actually can really get a grasp on what are specific solutions. The, we also need to start to change cultural assumptions. Uh, there's an expectation that every Austrian needs to have their schnitzel. The reality is, is every Austrian does not need to have their schnitzel. And for a large, long portion of the Austrians' history, uh, they, um, oh, sorry, we're just getting a little, okay. For a long portion of Austrian history, you weren't eating schnitzel every day. And so we have to remember that this, this idea that every, everyone needs to eat meat every day, sometimes more than once a day, is a illusion that we created in, a, in very recent times. And Brett, I'm glad you brought this up. I had somebody in a talk a couple, like a week ago, who, uh, or two weeks ago, who mentioned something like um, that you can't be an environmentalist unless you're a vegetarian. You have to be a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. If, if you're going to be an environmentalist. And, and I said, well, okay, um, you know, I'm not a vegetarian. I eat limited quantities of meat here and there. I particularly like to uh, eat uh, uh, organic, uh, regenerative produced meat uh, at tables when everybody around me is ordering a vegetarian food because they think that I'm going to judge them. Um, it happens a lot where I'll sit at a table after a talk or something and people will, everyone, every single person will order vegetarian and then look at me and like wait to see what I'm going to order. And then I'll order some, some sort of, you know, if, if it's organic or, you know, so I'll order some nice piece of meat just, and I'll say this, I'll say, look, 
how many of you are actually vegetarians? Inevitably, there's going to, a percentage of them are, but most, almost every time are not even vegetarians. They just are ordering it because of the assumed guilt or judgment I have. And so I want to say like, it's not about blaming and shaming you. I don't want to shame you or blame you for what your choices you make. All I'm asking everyone to do, and what we are asking everyone to do, being part of the regeneration, is to be conscientious about what we're eating, uh, eat in healthy levels, do not overconsume, and start talking about um, the things that we are consuming and doing in a way that is positive, engaging, and, and empowering to people. So, so in response to this person a few weeks ago who said uh, you have to be a vegetarian to be an environmentalist, I said, well, we don't need blame and shame. And instead of talking about veget being a vegetarian, you have to be a vegetarian, instead we should be talking about, you know, uh, telling the story of the delicious meal that we ate last night. And not even mentioning that it is vegetarian or had meat or not meat, just talking about how delicious that Thai noodle salad was that I made last night, you know? And, and, you know I tried it a lot, yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's really hard to talk about individual measures because as you pointed out, there is a lot of um, discussion going on whether it's important to focus on individual measures or on, um, on community measures. But as you said, both are important to really um, get to the goal. And that brings me to another question, because in the, in the end of uh, 2019, um, the Emission Gap Report um, said that it's really hard or it's almost out of reach to, to reach the 1.5 target, which is very important um, that, we, that we don't um, get to the tipping point or that um, the climate is not um, going into a hot house effect. Um, and also, weeks ago, um, Stefan, a, a really um, one of the top climate scientists in Australia, um, said that we actually cannot make it anymore um, to the 1.5 target. Um, how likely do you see it that we can still reach it, or what do you think about um, the one? I think these targets, well, helpful for you know certain types of stakeholder decision making. Um, are, are not really useful for everyday people's decision making. And there are lines in the sand, if that makes sense, where you, where you draw a line in the sand, and you, we shall not go beyond that line. The red lines? The red lines, so yeah. yeah. Something like this in, in, in translation. So, so I don't believe in supporting, I don't believe in um, uh, having lines that say, we need to do this, and if we cross that line, disaster, everything is a mess. If we're before this line, everything is good. Because that's not actually the truth and it's not what the IPCC is saying. It's not what any climate scientist is actually saying because it's not true. So, so I think um, uh, uh, what I would rather say is let's envision what that future that we actually want is. Let's name it, which I think is drawdown. I think that is the future that we want or a regenerative society. That's the future that we actually want. So let's name what we want, not think about a half measure here or this target or that target, get in. Let's measure the actual thing that we want. Envision how what is that what that vision actually looks like. Right? So what are the solutions that are there in that future? And then that is a target that we actually want to do everything we can to achieve as urgently and safely and equitably as possible. I, I, I do think it is a huge task to achieve. It really means looking at all of the systems, all the sectors that we talked about, transportation, electricity generation, building the built environment, building the built environment, food, land, agriculture, uh, 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 our ecosystems, and really looking at our society itself to, uh, to uh, support universal uh, uh, access to uh, reproductive health care and universal access to and quality of education. These, this is really redefining uh, systems. It is possible. It is absolutely possible. It is not a technology question or, or, or like a question of what to do. It's not a financial question. We have enough money to do it and there's a financial return. 
There are challenges economically in terms of infrastructure, but we have lots of historical examples of meeting the kind of infrastructure development needed to achieve these, this kind of goal. Um, and it, uh, uh, but what it is, it's a lack of will. It's a lack of political will from politicians. It's a lack of will from financial institutions to move capital as qu quickly, uh, move capital to that solution system. It's a matter of will from corporations to reassess the way they do business to move away from a competitive model to a collaborative capital capitalism. You know, we need to have co collaboration as the, the key, not conflict. Collaboration, collaborative cap capitalism. We need, to, we need to have the will of uh, educational institutions to embed climate solutions, which are really regenerative solutions. Remember those cascading benefits we talked about a little bit earlier, right? All these, all these benefits to human and planetary well-being that come along with this solution, the win-win-win-wins, the aha moments, right? Like all of that we need to be embedding in our educational systems. So this is a big task to ask folks, but it's, it's one of will. It's one of like setting the goal, doing it, and doing everything we can to push it. And if we do that, yes, 1.5 degree warming target is possible, absolutely. Um, and actually beyond that is possible. We can go beyond a 1.5 degree target, is possible. I wanna leave with one anecdote before, before we sign off here today. Um, first of all, it's been lovely speaking to you and this whole group of folks, I hope, um, at the European All Block Forum and, and for Fridays for the Future and Beyond. Um, but I wanna leave with one thing. I remember at the European All Block Forum last year speaking to, to Leo uh, and doing an interview with him and, and learning all about his engagement uh, in activism in Vienna. And uh, he, you know, he, he was so uh, front and center. What I mean, he, he was such a, an engaging, charismatic young guy. And I asked him, I said, well, so are you the leader of Fridays for Future Vienna? And he looked at me and I'll never forget his face. His face was like, he's like, leader? He goes, no, there's no leaders. Because we all just do as much as we can, as we can. I do a lot, he said, but no, we're not leaders. We all do things collectively. And, I, and I'm hearing that also from you, Anna, and I hear that from so many of the younger generations. And that is something we all need to learn from, that we needed to be distributed networks of communities and leadership that are flat, that we're all working together towards the functions that we're, we're doing to society. But I loved that, uh, that comment from Leo, uh, that it's like, like, what are you talking about? There's no, there's no leaders in this group. We're, we're all in this together. We, we're all working together on this. And I, I love that. And I love that about Fridays for the Future and, and all the great work that y'all are doing. I'm happy you had inspiring moments with Fridays for Future. And I think that's the big task the two of us um, should focus on to inspire other people. <laughs> and I hope to see you virtually or maybe at one day physically again at Pearl Man Park soon. I hope so as well. Well, thank you very much, Anna. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I'll see you next time uh, in, the, in the Alps, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> great. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>